Uh, okay, it's uh, recording now. Uh, we'll get started. Uh, it's my pleasure to invite uh, Vilay Tulos. Um, uh, Vilay was the machine learning infrastructure manager at uh, Netflix. Uh, he's also the uh, thinking head behind uh, Metaflow, which is a framework for full stack machine learning. Um, uh, recently, he started a, a startup, Outer Bonds, which is backing Metaflow's development. Um, and recently, he released a book. It's called Effective Data Science Infrastructure and How to Make Data Scientists Productive, which is the exact topic that we like to discuss and we are deeply interested in. Uh, I read this book uh, cover to cover. Uh, I can say it's an amazing book. Um, and I couldn't put down the book. It's so engaging and so engrossing that uh, I finished it in almost like a two uh, in a, in a two-day series sitting. Every sentence in that book is measured. It's a zero fluff. While some books, there are many books out there in this particular space, but uh, this book stands out because not only it gives you the thinking behind how, how for example, Willows and uh, no, Villain and his team you know, think about developing frameworks like a Metaflow, so not only you get into the design aspects of it, but also it's a very, very practical tool. It's not just theory, it's not just practice, it's a combination of both. So therefore, any aspiring data scientist that wants to, uh, for example, is very serious about deploying their models into the real world, I think it's a book to read. Uh, everybody will learn uh, a great deal uh, uh, by uh, reading that book. Uh, there are also a couple of talks uh, from Novile available on the public internet. Uh, what we like to do is to build on the top instead of asking the same questions that uh, we're already familiar with. It's a kind of prerequisite and pre-work for us to read what is available, how Vile, for example, thinks about building those solutions. So we like to build on the top, and that's the context. Uh, when we post uh, this uh, uh, session on YouTube, we'll also give the prerequisites that somebody should read you know, before getting into this conversation to get best out of you know, Vile's time. We value Vile's time very much. Uh, that said, the format is uh, you no know, Vile. It's a Q and A. You no, know, feel free to you no know, diverge. You no, know, mm -hmm. uh, whichever whatever that you want to say, please feel free uh, to anchor the uh, 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 the conversation. We I kind of organize the questions into themes. Okay, uh, I think that's how we'll go forward. Um, uh, for a context, uh, I'm really pick, um, you know, picking from where uh, Vile left off in 2019. At Amazon's reinvent, where uh, Metaflow was released you know, around, around the same time, and in Billy's own words, Metaflow enables data scientists to use their favorite libraries, prototype rapidly, handle large amounts of data, deploy to production, maintain critical workflows, experiment with different versions of data sets, models, even environments, uh, and coordinate complex projects. I think we can't wish for more holistic uh, approach to da doing data science than all these points. Uh, and uh, in their uh, probably 2018-ish times, uh, when uh, Sabine and uh, Willie uh, 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 spoke about uh, Metaflow, they kind of picked up three very core tenets. One on usability, how to make data scientists more productive. Second leg is scalability. Now we'll certainly touch some points about scalability. And the third is reproducibility. Here, reproducibility means that you no know, idempotency of the core and getting the right uh, data lineage right and, and the having the right uh, uh, you know, compute environment. Once all these things, things come together, then reproducibility is a possibility. But reproducibility itself is a big beast, and getting it right is not a joke. And uh, Metaflow goes to great lengths to make uh, data science reproducible. In summary, in, again, in Willow's own terms, uh, it's like you can ask for a laptop, laptop that you need. You know, say you can say that I need a 700 GB RAM and uh, CPU intensive laptop. You you can get it. Or you can say mine is a deep learning intensive, so I need eight GPUs. You can ask for it. All that happens via the decorator magic. Uh, that's the context of what Metaflow is and the kind of a core tenets that uh, Metaflow is based on. We'll really begin from here. No, really. Uh, you picked up these three core tenets, right? Usability, scalability, and reproducibility. How did you land on these three core tenets? And have you made any conscious decision to not to touch upon certain aspects? And what are they? You know, can you throw some, can you shed some light on 
on the on the core design tenets of Metaflow? Yeah. Well, let me first um, thank you so much for a warm introduction. Um, I'm I'm really glad to be here today. I mean, it seems that you guys are very sophisticated already. Like it seems that like your needs are like very much the kind of the types of problems that like we have been thinking about. I have been thinking about them. So I'm super super excited to have the discussion with you. So now you mentioned the the core tenets, and um, you know if you go today um, to metaflow.org, like one of the first things that it says there on the landing page is human centric infrastructure. So there's really that human aspect, and I guess one really overarching concern, like ever since the <clears throat> beginning, has been that we believe, I believe that uh, it is at the end of the day, people, individual data scientists, mach machine learning engineers, data engineers engineers all kinds of people who build these applications it is not i mean i don't think that we are yet at the point that the machines built themselves so many of these questions at the end of the day boiled out to the question of of usability and that was like one of the three that you mentioned here um and like the other two were were scalability and reproducibility and like if you think about it they are like in some sense like different sides of the same coin so like usability is of course the question that well especially people who are not maybe software engineers by training can you start using the tool relatively easily? And can you start actually like focusing on the problems that matter to you? So also our point of view is that the infrastructure like shouldn't take the center stage. It is really called infrastructure because it only provides the foundation, but it's of course the applications that matter at the end of the day. So the, the, the hope would be that many people can just start using the infrastructure, can start using Metaflow and then become productive. And can then like kind of the infrastructure fades in the background. You don't have to focus on it too much and you can start really focusing on, on your like own own problems and like the, your own domains. Now, scalability is an interesting question because, as you know, uh, data science, machine learning is a very experimental field. You always have to try out different approaches. Uh, like maybe there are many people like trying out different modeling approaches. And also, there's the question that like maybe you want to even automate part of the exploration. Maybe you want to do something like a hyperparameter sweeps and and so forth, or maybe you just need to build many different models at the same time. And now, in order to be able to do that, you kind of need scalability. And scalability, of course, like comes in, in in many many different shapes as well. But um, the basic idea is that you can actually use the compute power. You can, instead of having a single small laptop, um, you can actually farm out the compute, let's say, to the cloud. And then, let's say, if you have to train 200 models that each take one hour to train, you don't have to wait for, let's say, 200 hours to get the results. But maybe you can get the results in one hour which then like contributes to the usability and the fact that you can iterate really fast. And then the, the, the last point there, reproducibility. Um, it, it, interestingly, it also is related to, um, to human collaboration in a, in a sense that it, it's it, like when you think about collaboration, oftentimes the idea is that like you can really tightly work with other people, which is of course indeed the idea. But also it's really, really important that you can have isolated experiments. So you can say that like, here's my experiment A, and on the one hand, I can be sure that I can always, I don't have to worry about it, but I can run it again, like maybe two days later, three days later, even a month later, and get the same results. And also my colleague can get take the same result and they don't have to ask me that, oh, well, like what was the command line and like what were the libraries you installed and like what was the data set that you used? But I mean, the idea of reproducibility is really that you can kind of like minimize that unnecessary communication and coordination between people. And like if anybody in the in the best case, and I know that this is of course not quite the reality today, but in the best case, anybody could take, let's say a model or a workflow off the shelf, run it and get exactly the same results. And hence, you can really focus on things that matter. You can focus your collaboration on the things that matter and not this like a very a brittle collaboration that like everybody maybe must use the same environment to get the same results. So in that sense, like the usability, scalability, reproducibility, they're all like kind of a different sides of the of the question that like, how do we make data scientists productive? How do we make organizations productive? And uh, and it's definitely the answer is partly technical when it comes to scalability, but also, also it's a big part of like kind of providing something that humans can use easily. Okay, you know, wonderful, wonderful to hear that. Um, Maybe a slightly follow-up uh, no question to that is, uh, you know, obviously when uh, you, know, you began maybe in 2017 is when the idea of having your own framework kind of emerged out of a need. Uh, you know, if I recall you, know, you saying that uh, Netflix was, of course, you know, predominantly uh, a tech company and uh, recommendation engines were, uh, it's, it's a post boy for recommendation engines, but you have not many problems that are ML-centric, therefore there was a need for uh, a framework like Metaflow, and we are in 2022. So five years is a long time in the tech space. 
So what do you think, uh, for example, did the core tenets, you know, have the ground, you know, what kind of things were evolving, you know, in other words, how do you absorb changes and your own thinking and reflections in how the space is evolving and put them back into uh, a metaflow? Or is are there any things that you're consciously not attempting to solve because it can become a, 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 a kind of a, you know, it, it does, it seems to be doing everything, then people will not have a mental map or a mental model of what exactly Metaflow is. So any reflections on that one? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's always interesting, like when, when we have the feeling that the tech moves so fast, and, and certainly at some level, it is it is true that they are, of course, New libraries, and now if you look at the stable diffusion that just came out, and like it definitely feels that like oh, it's just over the past couple of weeks. I mean, people have experimented with amazing things, and it definitely feels that things are moving fast. Then, on the other hand, there are these really long kind of a macro arcs of of technology, uh, computer science, machine learning overall that take actually like decades, and and, and they are like really fundamental. And like, if you think about the stack, like how we oftentimes think Metaflow, that there are like these different layers of the stack, like starting with the most fundamental things that, well, I mean, like, how do we deal with data? I mean, that's, of course, a really a fundamental question and like has been for decades. And and the next one is, is compute. And I, I think that this compute part especially is something that is, is really of fundamental importance and like relates to scalability and so forth. And um, and I, I think it, it still like remains like, a, bit of a like unsolved problem i guess the kind of a dream world would be where like you can just define any function in any programming language and you click a button and like the function gets executed somehow automatically in let's say some cloud environment and like you get the results really fast and, and so forth so uh but i mean as you know i mean that is not exactly the reality i mean there's still like a lot of things that you have to set up and of course metaflow helps with that but i mean there's still work to be done so in that sense um uh, like the way how we started thinking about Metaflow is really thinking that okay, what are these like a, like really fundamental elements that we have to get right? Data, compute, then also orchestration, versioning, and so forth. And uh, I think that those things are like definitely they have progressed over the over the last five years. But at the same time, kind of a, I wish that they could have progressed even more. Um, like a example, like with with the compute is that. Um, we of course like we integrated with with aws like uh, since since the very beginning i mean of course the, all the same aws services are still available some new services have come uh, like they have been released since but i mean nothing nothing too dramatic and like there's still like much work to be done let's say now people are really excited about kubernetes of course kubernetes is hard to use i mean i don't like provides the elements of the the, the, the abstraction for compute but i mean still takes a lot of work so so i i think that those are like really in in some sense like rather slow moving processes um then orchestration is another interesting piece if you think about this question of like a dag or like workflow orchestration actually there are some blog articles around like when we uh built the first dag orchestration systems at the company uh, adroll even before when i was at netflix and like we used to use this open source project called luigi like back then like that came from spotify you may remember that uh, luigi and airflow back in 2014 they were kind of like released around the same time they were kind of the two contenders at the time, and uh, and 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 those were like super early days for these orchestration systems. And if somebody had told me 2014 that still in 2022 many people are using Airflow, and like in in some sense, like if you look at the Airflow or like if you look at the orchestration landscape, it's actually surprisingly little that has changed over the past eight years. Eight years is a long time. And, uh, and I, I feel that, for instance, this DAG orchestration piece is just a very fundamental piece of, of compute. And I wish that like it would be something that kind of just works out of the box. So if, if anything, I would hope that like kind of there had been even more progress. And the Metaflow's point of view has always been that we are happy to piggyback and leverage uh, existing tools so we don't have to reinvent those wheels. And Metaflow is rather layer. I mean, that's why it's called Metaflow. It kind of sits on top of like all the other flows out there and all the other systems out there. And like hence also like we benefit like when when these underlying systems advance and like the faster they advance, I mean it, it, the better it is for so for everybody. So so in that sense, um, there's some like a fast progress, some progress that could be even faster. So it's kind of interesting thing that way. Now um, when it comes to the question that like is there anything that like kind of a, I mean, if we could go back in time, we could we would change. It's actually again I, I think it like a. Mm -hmm surprising little i mean the metaflow was always designed with the idea that things will evolve and change over time if you have a look at the code base you can see that there's this 
plugin-based architecture, the idea is that, of course, the underlying systems change, so we can swap them out over time. Um, but like, hence, the kind of really the key question was that one thing that we don't want people to change is their code. So we are like a very feel strongly about the idea of backwards compatibility and the idea when data scientists write something, they shouldn't have to rewrite their code just because the underlying systems change. So that the basic API of Metaflow is actually such that like pretty much all code you have written in like 2018 in Metaflow still works today in 2022. And this is actually a big deal. I mean, we all talk talk about the stability as a service. So it's kind of an interesting to think that that like while the world world is moving and things are advancing, it's actually like quite useful also. And this goes back to the human centricity that there are things that you don't have to worry about. You don't have to worry about your Metaflow code breaking or like you having the micro that oh Metaflow released version like 1.3 or whatever it might be, and now I have to change my code. No, I mean like you should again. I mean focus on your own problems and not on the infrastructure. Well, no, that's just that's amazing. I mean, no, the, you go to great lengths to make sure that uh, backward compatibility is maintained. I think that same kind of, uh, I would say, you no know, respect for code, respect for other people's time, actually goes into you no know, designing Metaflow. Uh, uh, certainly, deeply appreciate uh, you know that kind of uh, uh, care that you uh, put towards building those uh, you know tools. Uh, a slightly related question is, uh, you no, know, obviously, you know, people have been doing machine learning, you no. Know, you know, maybe depending on how you count it, maybe from 1950s with all the you know, big data and uh, mobile penetration, uh, I think uh, access to cheap computing, I think uh, certainly made a tectonic shift in how we think about problems. And cloud happened, I don't know exactly the time, but certainly now infrastructure uh, as a core, these things are available, right? So did it fundamentally change how people think about problems? Now, for example, if I look at deep learning, not as a piece of science, but as a compositional algorithmic framework to compose ML applications. I think what Metaflow brings to the table is to also think about compute in a decomposable way, meaning you don't, you don't have to pre-commit a certain compute or a certain resource to it, right? Almost at will, you can reconfigure your under, underneath the runtime. So in that sense, having deep learning as a tech stack with uh, Metaflow as a glue, you know, with all the different layers that you spoke about, you no know, data, compute, orchestration, versioning, I think we are looking at a very, very powerful paradigm, even to compute, uh, to, to compose algorithms, also to execute and run them, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, what, what is your kind of a take on that one? Uh, you know, in summary, how did cloud help rethink uh, our approach to solving problems? And if you juxtapose uh, deep learning as a compositional framework and a combination of these two, what are we looking at? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, no, I mean, that's a... That's a great observation there. Uh, so now, if you if you think of, like you mentioned, obviously, like people have been processing. I mean, that's processing data for for decades, and that's what kind of computers were invented for, in the first place. And if you if you imagine the world, let's say in 1970s, and like of course, like people were programming and they were processing data in 1970s, and maybe the situation was such that like maybe at your college or university, like you had a big mainframe machine. And like everybody had to to kind of stay like uh, or like wait uh, outside the room to get access to the computer. And like maybe like there are stories how like a Donald Knut like was only able to use their mainframe at night, like when nobody else was using it and so forth. And uh, and obviously like that like severely limits your iteration speed. <clears throat> we talked about like the, how the parallelization can help to to, to uh, like reduce the iteration uh, speed or like increase the iteration speed and reduce latency. But now, if you imagine that like you have to wait for your turn to even get to the computer, I mean that's that's kind of the worst. And then of course, like with personal computers, the idea was that okay, at least I get my personal computer, so I don't have to wait to get to the kind of a mainframe. And that was definitely a big leap forward. But now you are limited by the fact that you have only your laptop, and and that's that's kind of like the computing power that it's at your disposal. Um, and then the next phase, and if you think of systems like Hadoop and Spark and like, of course, many other kind of a high performance clusters, the big challenge for the longest time was that <clears throat> how do we uh, design these like a very intricate scheduling systems and queuing systems so that like, let's say we have a hundred machines in our cluster and now we have a more workload. So how do we allocate the resources optimally? And like, how do we have queuing policies that like people can, can kind of access those resources in some fair manner? And all those questions again are like kind of the variations of the same theme that, okay, we have limited compute resources and we have to very carefully see who gets to use them and how. And uh, to your question about the cloud, I think that really the big paradigm shift in, in some sense is kind of this like a post scarcity 
thinking of, of compute that like what if compute were so abundant that that it wouldn't have to be rationed it wouldn't have to be so that like oh you have to stay in the queue in order to be able to execute your function but i mean like anybody can execute any function at any time and that is basically the the um the abstraction provided by the cloud now many people when i say this give pushback that yeah well i mean it costs money and uh, and of course like for companies like netflix it's easy to say that like anybody can like run whatever but i mean like factually i mean like every second of execution costs money and and that is certainly true now i, I do think that it really helps to change the equation that that uh you don't have to see it as a big capital expense you don't have to spend millions of dollars building your data center but it's more of a question that okay so how much is the how, how much can you allocate to the compute resources i think it makes makes those <clears throat> calculations a bit easier but I, I do think that that's a big change. And I, I think that that's, of course, like in the design of Metaflow, that's the whole idea with when you have like at batch decorator or something like that. The idea is that like you can just say that like execute this function in the cloud. And uh, and like the, the hope is that like you don't have to worry too much about it, like kind of a, like where it gets executed and how. So I think that that is, that is a big change. And Metaflow has been, of course, like a very cloud first um uh, like from the beginning and I, I think it really helps I, I think we are not yet quite there so i think that there's still like some ways we have to go and the cloud still have to develop but i i think it's amazing like what we're able to do these days then your question about um <clears throat> yeah do you want to talk about the gpus so like the, the the deep learning as well go ahead please yeah 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 i mean like just a quick take on that so it's interesting that um obviously like deep learning uh has been like a massive qualitative change like when it comes to machine learning now when it comes to infrastructure of course like in some ways gpus provide a lot of power but in, in some sense also like they have a com complicated things like quite a bit so as many of you may have experienced i mean getting access to gpus is harder um like making sure that like uh, actually like you have the right CUDA drivers you have the right kernels you have the right amis on on uh, amazon i mean that's actually harder uh, like also of course these days um you know that like getting even like a like or like running gpus is actually like a cost quite a bit of more money so in in some infrastructure sense like a gpus actually have cost like a quite a bit of headaches and of course like even libraries today i mean of course like libraries like pytorch and, and tensorflow are quite advanced but still like you can feel that like getting these things let's say like running on your like m1 laptop and like using the, the gpus and acceleration that's available there is, is is can be quite a bit of hard so so there's like an interesting angle that like that's a big advancement but in in some sense the usability has like a gone down even a bit compared to cpus so it's an interesting balance like when different organizations think about gpu access that cpus are kind of commodity i mean it's easy to handle kind of cheap and gpus are like still like feeling that it's almost like a step back to that world like where you have to really like kind of guard this like precious resource so yeah yeah and hopefully with intel's push towards uh no cpu centric computing maybe you know, we can run deep learning models even on CPUs. Yeah, uh, yeah more GPUs. So I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm sure that it will get fixed. So. Yeah. Uh, related to scale, uh, I think you touched aspects on scale. Scale, and I remember you speaking about mostly vertical scaling, uh, right? Do you have any affinity towards uh, vertical scaling as opposed to you know horizontal scaling? Uh, I think you kind of alluded to the hidden debt in uh, horizontal scaling, right? Uh, so what is your recommendation and uh, you have any particular recommendations to make and as far as patterns are concerned yeah yeah uh, uh, yeah and well i mean like for for those of you who might not know the term so the idea with horizontal scaling is this idea that you just get more computers so it's almost like having like a more and more laptops and then you can distribute the work over many computers <clears throat> and then the idea with the vertical scaling is that like maybe you have a bigger laptop more memory more cpus and, and so forth and uh now, if you look at the past, like 10 to 15 years, this uh, it was especially Google, like back in 2004, they released the MapReduce paper. And the central tenet of the MapReduce paper was this idea that like you can use rather cheap commodity hardware to do horizontal scaling. And they, they kind of portrayed that this was one of the key advantages of Google back in the day that they could just like had, had many, many, many servers and they had a way to distribute any workloads to these like rather cheap servers and then like the big innovation back in the day was that if failures happen you don't care about failures too much at the hardware level but the software takes care of them like Google okay, saying okay here's the server and like we can take it out of the pool automatically and there are many appealing uh, like many appealing features of, of that idea but it is also a fact that like first i mean with something like MapReduce, it, it, it requires a new paradigm 
you have to write your programs in a certain way. Um, and then like also, secondly, operationally, it's quite a headache for many companies uh, like who are not Google that you have to maintain this big fleet of servers. And thirdly, which actually like comes often as a surprise to people, is that there's a quite a bit of overhead um, in doing horizontal scaling. And it, it really comes as a surprise to many people that actually like in some cases, like a one computer can be faster than 10 computers, just because the communication overhead and the coordination overhead like between 10 computers is, is so much higher than like just having one like a beefier machine. And, and that's really the idea with vertical scalability. And this has been now especially true with, with deep learning that of course, like most companies these days, if they have, if they need to train a model, it's much easier to have like a uh, like a big server and like maybe multi GPU server. And then like you really, really like kind of want to train your model inside that server instead of let's say like trying to do distributed training, which is, which is way, way harder. So in that sense, the idea is actually like of vertical scaling is less controversial these days than it was like maybe five years ago and then you know, 10 years ago when everybody was using Hadoop. Now, also for data processing, I mean, I, in one presentation, I have this example where you, um, where you, if you think about Netflix as an example, Netflix back in the day had 100 million subscribers. Now, <clears throat> if you have, let's say, like uh, uh, 1,000 features, let's say you have this like a data frame, like 100 million people, 1,000 features, like maybe use one uh, bit per feature, like one byte per feature. So we are talking about, let's say, like 100 gigabytes of, of storage space. Now, I mean, it is quite possible, and even back then, it was possible to have a server like with 100 gigabytes of memory. And so you can kind of keep that data frame in memory fully. Uh, and then, of course, the pushback is that, yeah, well, I mean, but what if the number of subscribers grows? Well, I mean, and then, and of course, like, let's say the case of Netflix, the number of subscribers didn't grow, and now it's whatever, like 250 million. But the interesting thing there is that, like, so has the, the amount of memory that is available, let's say, on AWS instances, it has grown over time. And it has grown over time in such a way that, like, in, on, on any single year, you have been always able to keep the data frame of all subscribers of this size in memory. So, and so also like there's an interesting aspect of vertical scalability that the kind of the Moore's law and the law of like computers getting bigger. I mean, that hasn't exactly stopped. It had, may have slowed down, but it's actually amazing that like these days you can get instances with 700 gigabytes of memory. And for many companies out there, 700 gigabytes is, is a lot of space and like you can actually do amazing things. And oftentimes it just like makes life so much easier that you don't have to rewrite your program. You don't have to use different libraries. You don't have to deal with tens of servers because you can just like conveniently launch one of these instances, load everything in memory and like off you go. And uh, of course, combined with the fact that that like you can do per second pricing. Yes, I mean, of course, big instances cost more money. But I mean, like if you use the framework like Metaflow, you execute this one function, it runs for like whatever 90 minutes. It can be actually highly cost effective. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so terrific uh, you know, response, really. Um, uh, particularly at the Wadburn Institute, uh, you know, briefly describing what we do, uh, we are a not-for-profit uh, independent organization. Uh, our portfolio largely consists of uh, public health, agriculture, and few more to come. And uh, we are predominantly a computer vision shop at this time. Mm -hmm. um, so Makran, do you want to ask uh, your specific question about, uh, in general, you know, how does Metaflow support dealing with com vision data sets or image data sets or videos? And, it's, we don't have that many you no know, tablet data sets, even though we have fewer presentational data sets. But uh, in general, if you were to process videos and images, right? How do you, you know, think about scaling data, also scaling compute in this particular sense? Yeah, I, I think just to add to that, you had one of these examples where I suspect there was this S3 module in the Metaflow component, which uh, I think you mentioned that it can download at 20 gigabytes per second. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was like considering would that also work for image and video kind of data and how, how would that scale? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And uh, we we thought about that question uh, quite a bit overall, like the question of computer vision, like obviously like back at Netflix, you can imagine that Netflix also has a bunch of videos that they may want to analyze at times. Um, so there are like many, many different directions where you can go. I can mention a couple of things that are relevant. One, one interesting question is that, um, like let's put these like a uh, uh, deep learning use cases aside uh, there are some use cases for videos where you may want to execute some function let's say on a per frame basis or like maybe you have a very short segment of video let's say 10 seconds and maybe you want to do something with, with with that segment and then like of course now if you have a 
let's say two hours of material or whatever like you you can easily have thousands and thousands of of these individual function executions and now one interesting question with that comes that well it kind of might feel natural to um, express each one of these function executions as a metaflow task which then results to the fact that uh, you may have tens of thousands if not hundreds of thousands of individual metaflow tasks and there have been like a couple of people who have been asking about it in the past and and uh, and that like how, how to actually manage that there like there's some functionality that makes it a bit easier but actually like that particular thing due to the way like how there's some like a latency in launching the task i mean that that like could, could work better um so actually like what you need to do today if you want to do something like that is that you kind of need to batch up more work per task basis uh, so that like you don't have to necessarily launch hundreds of thousands of tasks so that is that is one interesting aspect i mean definitely if you have use cases like that uh like we can we can talk more about it um now of course like a deep learning use cases are different because these frameworks are actually like quite nicely optimized that like if you can just load the data let's say from s3 really fast you don't have to look at individual frames but you can just like dump the videos and they will handle handle the frames and the and the kind of the, the data ingestion like in internally and there of course the one big question becomes the the data loading part so how do you implement your data loader and uh, indeed as you pointed out uh, there is the s3 class and what the metaflow s3 does is that it internally it it really heavily parallelizes the downloads from s3 and as you may know s3 is actually really really well scalable when it comes to the number of concurrent connections and especially if you have one of these larger instances in order to saturate the network bandwidth of that instance you must have you must use multiple uh, s3 connections and it's actually surprising that many libraries uh, that you can use off the shelf where you can give like s3 colon slash slash something something uh, they don't actually parallelize the connections uh, enough which leads to the fact that you are not maximizing the throughput which leads to the fact that your data loader might be too slow which leads to the fact that your gpu utilization might not be high enough so of course like yes as you know if you have done this type of work before of course this like optimizing the data loader so that you can saturate your gpu utilization is, is one of the things that you need to be looking at and indeed the metaflow s3 can help there um so that that is one important thing uh we we have some examples we have done some experiments with pytorch pytorch lightning uh how to do uh, cv with those with metaflow basically it works well i mean of course like by itself if you launch a big gpu instance i mean you can use these frameworks as before so i mean nothing too special needed um so you can just use metaflow s3 for data loading and so forth um i mean if you are interested in distributed learning that's a that's another interesting question that like we can we can dive into separately if that's that's of interest yeah, I don't know if this helps, but I mean, like, happy to talk more. It's a, it's a, it's a complex topic, of course. I mean, like, I don't want to underestimate that there are like many nuanced questions, and especially like the larger your scale, I mean, the fact is that the harder it becomes, and uh, and I, I don't think that there are like any any silver bullets today. Um, it, like when you really operate at the large scale, when you operate at the medium scale, I mean, typically things work quite fine out of the box. So. Yeah, certainly. Uh, even we are trying uh, Metaflow internally. I'm sure that we'll come up with the. Uh, interesting you know, examples and uh, you know uh, interesting issues you now we need to resolve certainly we'll be in touch with you to get around those things um uh, so maybe we'll slightly change gears and talk about you know productivity related aspects uh you no know, you remarked earlier that uh, you know for example git is you know very code centric you know, uh, you know uh, the entire ecosystem, right? The core, the IDEs, and the version control is all made to work with code. But mm -hmm. uh, you know, machine learning is is a uh, data centric, and by definition, it's kind of you know very exploratory in the beginning. It can become confirmatory towards the end. But in some sense, I think the the core centric view of developing software 1.0 versus exploratory nature of software 2.0, I kind of uh, have this kind of a tension, you know, between these two. And you made a remark that uh, Git is not JIT or whatever, however it's called. It's not mm -hmm. a natural fit for exploratory ML. Can you, you know, throw some light on that one? Why did you, you know, feel that way? And if you look at some of the tools like uh, DVC, data version control, it centrally operates around Git as a construct. Uh, for example, it locks the metadata of a data set and it, and it, it gets it, right? So mm -hmm. while it doesn't, it doesn't look like a natural fit, but people are revolving or, or kind of centering some of the tool sets around Git because that's so 
when entering in the software world now what are your reactions or comments if any yeah yeah well i mean for starters uh it's it's worth mentioning that of course like it get <clears throat> it's, it's, a, it's just like a really excellent tool i mean the most mainstream solution for versioning code so when it comes to test it like a basic software hygiene that like when you develop let's say the python flow code yes i mean indeed i mean you should be using git and like every now and then like you should make commits to git and like if you follow some kind of a, like a git ops best practices maybe you create pull requests stuff like that i mean all that is good and fine and as far as i know all companies using metaflow used git for versioning code as as like any other software artifact and in fact uh, as you know for the longest time when it comes to notebooks um, there has been this like a question that okay how do i how do we use notebooks with git and then there have been like problems especially with diff i know that like people have been really working hard to fix those issues but in that sense also like one idea with metaflow was that well if you have like basic python scripts they work really nicely with git which actually makes it easier to use uh, git with these machine learning pipelines which is a good thing so like by 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 no means we are like somehow against using git now i think like while the git is necessary i don't think it's sufficient and like you alluded to the the, the big question is of course about the data and the experimental nature of these workflows and I, I can give you an interesting anecdote about this that uh, at my previous company um at one point i did an analysis of the most productive engineers that like who are the people who create most commits so of course like as you know if you're a software engineer working at the company i mean the more commits you make i mean i guess maybe you are doing more work and like you're more productive whatnot it turned out that the most productive person at the whole company was a data scientist who had way more commits than than anyone else at the company and like kind of he had thousands and thousands of commits and uh, and then like I, I looked into it and know oh, this is surprising uh, and it turned out that like he was using r studio and he had it r studio configured so that like every time he clicked execute it made com it made a commit and now when other people saw this when other software engineers like saw this he said that no no i mean you use, you are not using git right i mean that's not the ways how you are supposed to be using git and like like of course like you are supposed to like a software engineering mindset is that you make some changes and you test them locally and then you package up this like a beautiful patch you made a commit you make a pr and that's the way how you are supposed to use git well now the thing is that like in the point of view of the data scientist what he was doing made absolute sense because he wanted to have versioning for any every single experiment and this is the the exact tension about the, the git that while it works totally fine for software engineering like it is a bit problematic in this sense for for data science where you want to preferably like a, a, or version and track every single thing you do and this is of course also a reason like why we have all these experiment tracking systems like comet ml and weights and biases and maybe ml flow and so forth that like there is this notion that like we want to track everything and this is also like why in metaflow ever since the beginning like we started like with this idea that let's track everything because this idea of experimentation is so central to data science and also interestingly like we saw um that when data scientists are required to do the versioning by hand and like let's say the artifact persistence per, by hand oftentimes people are overly conservative they think that oh i don't need to version this thing i don't need to store this thing because i mean this is probably not going to be useful and i'm just like like a quickly like hacking something and then of course what happens is that then like after maybe 10 days they realize that oh i mean what was that thing and i wish i had actually versioned that thing and uh, and that's why we thought that okay i mean let's let's not even ask people i mean let's version everything because also a fact is that people overestimate the kind of the storage footprint oftentimes when i ask that okay how come you didn't save it i mean people say that i didn't want to save it because i was afraid that like it's just waste yeah. storage takes money and so forth but honestly the amount of money today in like s3 like especially because uh, metaflow does deed application it's absolutely minuscule so that was the idea that okay i mean in this world i mean it's way better to store everything track everything by default and like have that as a built-in feature and of course like in addition use git alongside but i mean that should be really a first class thing in data science okay yeah i think you you answered my question that if you want to store everything if, if you want to snapshot everything right and i think you can cut a storage cost but you're saying that that's so cheap maybe you know if the use case is so advanced maybe we can have some scripts to push this with some policy, right? Push the data sets that are exactly. not used. Exactly, exactly. So, I mean, then you can set TTLs in your S3 buckets uh, and so forth, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, Harsh, uh, go ahead, you have a question. Yeah, actually, hi, Well, I actually wanted hmm. to ask about the versioning thing. Uh, I was wondering, like, 
how does the snapshotting thing in case of metaflow works for example the case where we re we are able to reproduce a production run on a local and look back into it like basically we don't have to rerun it on prod environment so this kind yeah so sorry i mean like what was the question exactly like how does it work technically or like how does it work in that kind of, uh, sort of like, uh, like what are we capturing when we are saying like we're snapshotting our particular run in the prod and like how are we looking back into it to reproduce it in on the local yeah yeah so so every time you execute um metaflow flows like you get runs and like whatever you assign to self dot something it uh, stores as what we called artifact and like how it works is that it takes that object uses python pickle to pickle that object serialize it and then store it like let's say if your data store is s3 it stores in s3 and now assuming that your local machines development machines have access to s3 now you can use this thing called metaflow client to then like refer so every Every single Metaflow executions get gets uh, like a unique uh, run ID, so you can refer back to any particular run. You can refer back to any particular step and any piece of data that was produced. And then you can say that okay, now I want to look at the model that was produced yes yesterday by by a colleague of mine or something like that. And then it goes back to S3 and like fetches that particular element. So and and that indeed it works across production and uh, and and testing and. Uh, and the key thing there is that these artifacts are immutable. So the idea is, in that sense, it's actually very much like Git, like in the same way as this, like a Git commit trees and so forth are, are immutable blobs. And the key thing here is that this also ensures that like you can't accidentally break production. Since, of course, like we wouldn't like to be in a situation where somebody is testing something locally and they, they touch the production data and then the production breaks. But as long as you have this like immutable read-only artifacts, I mean, it's very safe to kind of even look at the production data and do whatever you want with that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, on the aspect of collaboration, uh, you, 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 I think recently introduced uh, the idea of tags, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you no know, tags, projects, namespaces. Uh, how does it help, uh, you know, collaborating on multiple projects? I think at some point, uh, maybe you no, know, quite a long, long time back, you mentioned that collaboration is, for example, it's a messy affair, right? Getting it right is not, mm -hmm. not easy. And how did you resolve that, uh, that, that aspect and, and made, made collaboration also uh you know a, a, a kind of a core principle uh in in metaflow to support usability yeah well i mean first I, I i do want to say that it's a it's a bit still like ongoing journey I, I don't want to claim that like we have somehow solved it i mean it is still like remains like a messy affair um yeah. but like a couple of things that help i mean one thing is exactly what i mentioned before about this idea that you get this immutable log of artifacts like exactly like it um so that the first principle is that like people shouldn't be afraid i mean you know this is like one of the first like like the biggest impediments to collaboration yeah. is that like you are afraid that you break something and this is let's say maybe there's a new person joining your team and the new person of course i mean they are like quite scared that they don't know what they are doing necessarily they don't know the systems and they are afraid that they might break something and our guiding principle has always been that it should be so that you can have a new person joining the team and you can tell them that like you can basically do almost whatever you want and you don't have to be afraid and I think that that's really that the, the first first wow. principle that like when you remove that fear of breaking something, then like people are like much much more willing, much more able to collaborate. Um, now the the other side of the messiness is that while these immutable artifacts are really nice in the computer point of view, uh, the challenge is of course that like people's interpretation of the world changes. So the the world is not immutable in that sense that like. You write something and that stays true forever. Of course, the fact is that let's say you produce a model and you are happy about the model, and then two days later, you, you realize that the model is actually broken. So now, let's say that if that model artifact is immutable, you can't go back in time and somehow fix it. You have to produce a new one. But you want to attach an interpretation. You can attach a tag, and you can say that, by the way, that run that produced that artifact was actually broken. Don't use this thing. And that's like how we think about tags as a way to enhance this like a human in the loop collaboration, that they are kind of like a like really like labels that you can attach people can attach but then importantly also remove so you can remove tags so those are perfectly mutable and you can say that oh i mean by the way this is the current best model that we have maybe that model is not great anymore maybe this is the production version that is the staging version whatever is the kind of the the the, the set of set of interpretations that you want to attach i mean you can use tags to do that yeah yeah uh, i think kind of a related question that makran has was no, does Metaflow offer new constructs to 
elevate this fear of you know the storage becoming ever increasing if you want to snapshot everything it, and they're immutable definitely they support reproducibility and newbies can start working you know from day one but does metaflow offer any simple you know tricks or hacks to make sure that you know we don't blow up the the storage space or that's something like a new feature it was you know coming down the line yeah well i mean it, yeah if the question is about like how do you make sure that the storage doesn't like grow infinitely over time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, yeah. So, like one one idea there is that, uh, like especially S three. I mean, you you have features that you can set the time to live. You can set the lifecycle policies. Uh, so let's say if there are flows that you absolutely don't care about uh, anymore, so you can set that. Okay, maybe whatever is the right number for you, but maybe after ninety days, like one year, uh, like you can get rid of the old stuff. The the interesting challenge there though is that. If you are very aggressive with these lifecycle policies, and due to the fact how um, Metaflow has this like content-based storage engine, like you don't want to remove artifacts that were created a long time ago, and then they are, they are still used. So you need like a bit more sophisticated garbage collection, which is actually a feature that like we we have been planning to release. So that like you can kind of a, like get get rid of like a newer stuff without without breaking anything. So that's something that okay. is is coming at some point as well. Yeah, that that will be cool to have. Yeah. Um, so you you touched a certain uh, aspect of uh, Metaflow client, right? So in that sense, you are saying that you can actually offer uh, first class support for notebooks. You know, after you have your models run, you can actually inspect what exactly you are the predicting. You can even save plots uh, with the with the pure impure by impure Python object, so that you no know, the dependency hell uh, does not happen. So in that sense, you offer uh, support for notebooks as a first class uh, you know, citizens, right? Uh, at least as far as the confirmatory analysis is concerned. But uh, there's also the attention, you know, the point that you mentioned earlier about uh, you know, Git being not the right kind of a framework for exploit analysis, but still we, we work with it because there mm -hmm. is a value in it. But that mm -hmm. said, uh, uh, and you know, this is like a, a very sensitive topic. People are passionate, passionate about notebooks. No, some right. just hate notebooks, right? Even if the team has kind of divided in terms of using notebooks, right? Um, so, uh, and, and that space also changing, as, as you mentioned, for example, uh, FastAI, you know, Jerome Howard at, uh, at uh, FastAI, for example, they released a new uh, tool called NBDev. Uh, it mm -hmm. seems like you're also using NBDev for, uh, you know, uh, documenting Metaflow or outer bonds that right. uh, itself, right? So, so where do you see, I mean, how do you resolve this particular tension, you know? Uh, notebooks are great for expertly things where you don't know beforehand what you're exactly looking for, uh, but uh, it's kind of an opposite of uh, software engineering best practices, right? You want to have you know, version control, you, know, you have to have a neat and nice class and objects cut out, but that's not going to happen, right? right. So in, fundamentally, there's a dichotomy in how you think about a problem, right? And there, there are two different opposing uh, camps that exist. Uh, is there a, can we have, is there a reconciliated point, uh, a sweet spot, so to speak? Yeah, yeah, no, that's a that's a great question, and uh, I mean, definitely a topic that we have thought about a lot. Also, like, have had many discussions. Exactly like you said, I mean, there are people strongly in favor, strongly against, and of course, like most people, somewhere in the middle. And uh, I think, like, one like thing to to note in the beginning is that notebooks are an amazing tool, an amazingly flexible tool, and none of these issues that we will be discussing are technical constraints. So, I mean. Of course, technically, you can execute whatever in a notebook. So it is not that like something is not physically possible in a notebook. Technically, you can you can probably build an operating system in a notebook. Somebody will show a hack like that and then, and then say that, no, I mean, you can do anything in a notebook. Yeah, sure. I mean, you can do anything in a notebook. That's not the question. Now, the, um, the question is, of course, that like, what are kind of the sweet spots like for notebooks? Like, what are notebooks really good at? Well, I mean, now, I think every, well, I mean, I, I don't want to assume anything about your team, but I mean, like in most places, in many places, people agree that notebooks are really good for exploratory analysis, like using as a scratch pad, so forth. And I personally, I use notebooks all the time for use cases like that, are absolutely okay, and like rather non-controversial. I think then the interesting question becomes that, okay, so should you be able to build like kind of the final production grade artifacts in a notebook. And that's like when things start getting a bit hazier. And uh, one thing there to note, and what when I have observed, like also like my use of notebooks is that it's it's really not only a technical question, but it's also like a bit of a mindset question that I have noticed that like when one 
does data science they're like almost like a two different modes oftentimes so there's the very open-ended exploratory thing that I, I just I, maybe I get a new data set I have no idea what's going on in this data set I just want to visualize it I want to plot some distribution stuff like that very rapid iterations and I know that like all that code may be like a throwaway code I mean I, I don't need to store that code per se and like notebooks totally fine with that and like maybe I don't even need to version like stuff I mean maybe I'll just like quickly kind of explore the data but then um, at the point like when I'm actually like starting to have an idea what I want to produce it's not only that um, that somehow the code changes, but it's also like that I start thinking the problem a bit differently because then the concerns become a bit different. I start thinking that, okay, I need to make the code readable so other people can understand it. And like, of course, the performance becomes a concern and like and like a bit that, okay, how, 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 do, how do I make it so that it doesn't fail like when new data appears? So then also the way how I would write the code changes. And like, even if I'm in a notebook, I mean, I would be writing the code differently. And I think that this is even true for NBDEV. That like if you look at yeah. notes that are meant for exploration, they look very different than the NB dev, the actual kind of software artifact notebooks. And then like interesting question becomes then that okay, is the notebook is Jupyter Lab? Is is it the best IDE? Would you rather use VS Code uh, or like PyCharm and, and and all those questions? And and then we are in the territory that okay, if the code looks different, if anyway, I mean there are many other great IDEs available. I mean like well, it doesn't necessarily have to be a notebook. Notebooks still great for exploration. Like when you built this like a more persistent sort of software artifacts. I mean, there are many other great tools available. So so that's that's I think that 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 gray area in the middle is like what really causes the tension. And we are like of the camp that I mean absolutely use notebooks for exploration. There are many benefits of I mean they're like amazing software tools. I don't think that like all software engineers, for instance, will start using notebooks uh and because they're like they're like good reasons why people love their IDEs like uh today. Uh, and and I, I know that like for data scientists, of course, I mean, there's a bit of a kind of a maybe even a context switch that happens. But I, I think that that context switch might not be so bad because you kind of have to think about things a different way, like when you start thinking things in the long term and not only in the short terms. Okay. okay. Uh, I think we are kind of 9.54 uh, in the IST. Uh, we'll have a few more minutes. Uh, maybe, you know, you know what, is, what is coming in Metaflow? You know, uh, sandboxes. And uh, you know, at the conversation, you mentioned that Metaflow is kind of non-opinionated. Now, but uh, depending, do you have any recommendations like uh, kind of ML design patterns where you say you can use ML flow like this for this particular case? You know, what's coming? That's one. Second, uh, mm -hmm. is there support for streaming? And then the third is uh, about dynamic resource allocation. This question is from Harsh. Right now, for example, in your decorators, right, you say, I need a 160 GB RAM you know, system, right? But as your grow, as your data grows, as, you, as your uh, requirements change, maybe you want to have a different system, right? How do you manage that? Yeah. OK, so I think that that was like a four questions packed in one. So OK, so so maybe maybe I can I can quickly answer the question that uh, what's what's new and coming? Well. Um, there are like some really exciting new things uh, in the in the pipeline. Uh, one one thing is that we'll absolutely release support for other clouds. Like um, the the Azure support is basically already there. I mean, not not publicly released, but will come out soon. We are working on GCP. Uh, that's coming. Of course, like you know that uh, we have been working on Kubernetes and continue working on the Kubernetes. So that that works great. Many companies are using that successfully. Also, something that might be quite exciting for a number of companies is that we have been working on integration with Airflow. So, I mean, for those organizations who are maybe using Airflow for data engineering, and then the data scientists say that, oh, I mean, we would rather use Metaflow. You don't have to make a choice that now everybody must migrate to Metaflow or like everybody must use Airflow. But um, let's say you can keep using your old Airflow pipelines, and then like you can let data scientists, maybe even data engineers, use Metaflow, and then those get automatically exported to Airflow. So that's quite quite cool. Um, there are like many, many backend changes. Like we have been looking into optimizing Conda, optimizing the metadata service client, all kinds of like a plumbing stuff like that. So that's pretty cool as well. So, so definitely, I mean, like really many, many exciting features like uh, coming, coming out. And of course, like definitely interested in hearing your thoughts and comments, like all the things you mentioned about the computer vision. There are like a features that we have been thinking that could help on that front as well. So, I mean, definitely join our Slack and, and let us know. Um, so so yeah so that's that um, I, I think you had you had one question about the the, the patterns streaming. and then there was the very yeah support and maybe for streaming? Yeah. and support for streaming yeah that that's an interesting case so now 
support for streaming can can mean many different things um so maybe i'll kind of just like a split a few different use cases so one very common use case is that you have a streaming data source um and then like let's say you want to train your models like periodically or like maybe you want to run some inference and uh now there are like different ways how you can arrange that uh, even even today i mean like metaflow is definitely being used in use cases like that usually it involves that like let's say you have a kafka stream maybe you have some sync you create parquet files maybe you use things like iceberg to kind of manage the tables then you can like load those things in metaflow and like update the models every now and then so there's definitely a way to do that another interesting streaming cases are these inference use cases like we had some use cases even at Netflix, like where we created the model every now and then with Metaflow, then like did the inference using Flink. Uh, Metaflow doesn't necessarily like support those use cases out of the box uh, today, but I mean like it really works well alongside those use cases. So it's not that like you somehow must stop using Metaflow if you have streaming use cases. So it's more of a question of patterns. My stance overall is that like a streaming, it is, it is not trivial infrastructure wise. It takes actually like a lot of expertise to, to kind of uh, maintain these systems at scale. Um, so it is a fact that like oftentimes if you can do things more in a batch manner, I mean, it makes life easier. So one, one shouldn't underestimate that. Yeah. And uh, I can I can touch the dynamic allocation or did you have some other questions first? So No, uh, yeah, go ahead please. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a, the, the dynamic resource allocation. And for those of you who might not know what it refers to. So the idea is that in Metaflow, you you can have at resources and then like in at resources you can say that okay i mean like i need 100 gigabytes of memory or something like that but the interesting question is that like what if you don't know the amount of memory you need in advance but you would rather let's say take a look at your data set and then decide that oh actually like it seems my data set requires 150 gigabytes and then you can change the resource on the fly so i believe that that's that that's the question so um so yeah, no, I mean, today the, the way how we have been recommending that how you can do it as a kind of a workaround is that you can have a static branches and then you can choose like one of the branch that, okay, here's like a, like you need to use this branch, like for the large data set, this for the medium and this for the small. I mean, that works today, but of course it's a bit clunky. Uh, so so yeah, the, the kind of a short answer is that like, it's not supported today. I mean, definitely something that like we have been hearing a lot. I can just say that, like a slight challenge there is that like when we work with all these different orchestration systems like Argo and Step Functions and Airflow, the question is that like sometimes these systems require that the resource allocations are defined in advance. So it's not always easy to, to change them on the fly. And we want to make sure that like we can we can work with all these systems. So that's kind of the biggest question mark. But um but I mean definitely have heard that request loud and clear. And I, I believe that like at some point I mean there will be a solution for that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as a closing remarks, uh, you know, do you like to comment on the book? Uh, I hear that uh, you know, part of the revenue goes towards, you know, to the community, right? Uh, any remarks mm -hmm. you want to make about the book? Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, definitely. Like all of it, all of it that comes to my side, I guess the publisher needs to make a living. So, I mean, they keep their part, but I mean, like, yeah, anything coming my way, I mean, totally goes to support. Like all the amazing data scientists who maybe haven't been like represented so well, in this community before i mean going back to the philosophy of metaflow i do believe that it's ultimately it is the people and overall like there's always the question of like ai ethics and like what ai will mean for society my belief there is that it is absolutely important that like we have people who come from different backgrounds who get to work on these systems and like it should become i really want to avoid the word like democratization because it's way overused but i mean that's roughly the kind of the sentiment that more and more people like should be able to do these things and of course like that requires some support as well yeah no i mean the book like is really the motivation for that is that like uh, oftentimes when i gave presentations about about metaflow and data science how to make data scientists productive overall um as, as witnessed by this discussion, amazing questions, but I mean, still it feels that like in one hour, we only barely scratched the surface. We could easily yeah. keep talking for another five hours. Always yeah. felt that we had run out of time. And that was the idea for the book that, okay, so maybe maybe like a book can afford us to go a bit deeper in these questions. So I think that that kind of works. I mean, still feels that after like 350 pages, so many questions left unanswered. So maybe yeah. it needs a sequel at some point, but I mean, definitely <laughs> I hope that it's a step towards the right directions. Absolutely. You know, I completely agree to that. It's an amazing book. You know, everybody, if you get a chance, uh, please buy and support uh, the cause. And uh, it's a great resource. And really looking forward to your sequel, you know, with all the learnings yeah. and uh, you know, Q&A sessions that you're holding. 
uh, I think we took about an hour of uh, Vilay's time. Uh, Vilay, thank you very much for your time. I hope uh, you know, this is educating for all of us and uh, looking forward to interacting, interacting with you more and your team down the line. Yeah. Th thank, thank you, you. thank you for having me. And uh, by the way, I, I do want to say that I, I really, really appreciate and like I'm super excited of the work that you are all doing. So that is extremely important. So and like we are happy to help any way we can. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Willie. Thank so, you. Thank you, folks. Have a rest of the day. Good rest of the day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.